Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I woke up this morning, and uh, I kind of take an interest in shuffleboard. I'm kind of semi-retired. I'm over here in the capacity, advisor capacity for the company I work for in New York. Came down about seven, eight years ago. And during that time, I, I kind of joined the shuffleboard in uh, Pasadena, where my home is now. And uh, I, I, the wife and I have become pretty good at it. So they invited a, uh, a team to come in from Long Beach and play us. So I got up early this morning, and the wife and I went down. We knocked the hell out of them. And then I rushed home and changed, and then I rushed in the car and rushed over to the International Airport through all the fog and smog that's down Los Angeles. And when I got to the airport, uh, they told me the plane wouldn't be pulling out for another 40 minutes because it was having a hell of a time getting into the airport. So after sitting there a while, I eventually caught the jet, and I arrived here up at 12, and a good uh, friend of mine, Matty, was there to meet me, and another good friend invited me out for dinner, and uh, here I am after a real busy day, and I think it was worthwhile when I look around these nice people here tonight. You know, I'm a Scotchman. And uh, my name, of course, I'm an alcoholic, and my name is Jeff. Now, all of you say, hello, Jeff. That's the boys. <laughs> and uh, I was born in Scotland. The wife was born in Scotland, too. God bless her. And, you know, I found as I uh, kind of progressed through the different stages of becoming an acute alcoholic, I, I kind of become more and more irresponsible with my money. And uh, when a Scotsman tells you that, you can rest assured his life has become unmanageable. <laughs> you know, this drinking. I was quite willing to sacrifice the love of a good wife and family as long as I could keep on drinking. It reached the stage, of course, where she had to go out of work and try and keep the house together. And while I, she was out, I'd be desperate for her to get a dollar, and I'd take anything out the house and sell it to get a drink and stuff like that. And it eventually reached the stage, of course, that the wife couldn't see anything in the future for her or the family. This life couldn't go on. We lived in Brooklyn then, in New York. And she dragged me to court and uh, on 4th Avenue on 64th Street there in Brooklyn. And the little Italian judge in those early years would be sitting up on the bench and he'd listen to the wife, how he used to bring smokies in, drink smoke and all this kind of stuff. And then he'd ask me if I had anything to say and of course I couldn't say anything against what she had said. And then he'd tell me, well, if you go near that house when you leave this court, I'll put you away for six months. I'd have no money. I'd have nowhere to turn. I didn't know what to do. She'd go out one door of the courtroom, and I'd go out the other. And it, it didn't happen before, of course. And at a time like that, I used to make for the Smokies, what we call in New York Smokies. There was about eight or nine of us when we were all down and out and up against it out of the house. We'd get together, and we'd... Get along 4th Avenue in Brooklyn at the subways there, and we'd panhandle a little while. So we'd get about 30 or 40 cents between us. And then we'd make for the hardware store and get to the natured alcohol. It's used for removing, you know, paint off furniture. And then we'd get behind a garage and go through the mysterious ritual of making the mix. And then in there, if it was in the summer, we'd get into Leaf Erickson Park down there and... There, the eight or nine of us would be sitting on the grass and interrupted only by invigorating snorts of this smoke. We discussed at great length what the hell was the matter with the government and when were they going to do something for the working man. 
I'd hang out with that gang. We'd hang out. We'd get down to Barrio. We'd get around to Sally's. We'd get around to Mission. We'd dispose of anything we had on that we could sell. I'd eventually I'd have an old shirt, an old pair of pants, old shoes on. We'd sleep any place we could. We'd get in a Sally once in a while. God bless the Salvation Army. They'd give us a good night's sleep once in a while. The only trouble was you had to be saved every night before you could get a sleep. <laughs> and I'd hang out with that gang for a number of days till eventually I'd reach a stage of just on the edge of going nuts. I'd be sitting in the gutter on the curb talking to myself, old shirt, pants, ridiculed by a kid, Pedestrians passed me in the, the same kind of idea. Those early years, that's what the alcoholic got when he reached a stage like that. And I'd be sitting there, eventually I'd be picked up by the cops, and when it happened in Brooklyn, it slapped me into the King's County, and when it happened in New York, I'd be slapped into Bellevue. We'd draw a veil over the hospital, the jacket for four or five days, and the... Being there for four or five weeks, but they're coming out the hospital. And they all, they'll always give you the old stuff that they picked you up in. I'd start the old pants, the old shirt, and not a feeling of loneliness. Feeling of self condemnation, full of remorse. My brain was cleared up a little bit. I didn't know which way to turn, didn't know what to do, where to go, or what to do. And I had one question in my mind. Why the hell am I in this predicament again when I swore last time? I'd never get like this. Why? Why, I had no answer, ladies and gentlemen. I had no answer. I'd start thinking of the wife at home. How can I get home? God, how can I get home? God, I'll never touch the scrub again. I'm through this time. God help me, I meant it. And with that thought in mind and the hope that somehow I'd be able to get home somehow, I'd shovel off and get a job around the diners, dishwashing. And my God, if it's any profession, it should be marked unfinished business. It's lousy dishwashing. And I'd save a few dollars a day I made, knowing in this half dull mind of mine that I'd never get home if I got drinking. And I'd save those few dollars until I got on a decent front. And the company I worked for was a salesman. And it had been always their habit to let start drinking to tell me to get the hell out of there and come back when I was sobered up. And I'd get back to the company and tell them never again, never again. And I'd get started in. And I don't know, we alcoholics, some other, if we're on the beam, we have certain gifts, but in a very short time, I'd be producing with the best of them. And then I'd contact the wife. B. B, let me come home, huh? Let me, give me a chance to be responsible for you and the kids and the home. You don't know what all your life gone through this last few months. Give me a chance to come home, B. And that good wife would listen to me. And then God help me, I'd have to listen to her. <laughs> and then, all right, Jeff, we'll try it again. We'll try it again. And I'd get home. Ah, oh, damn, clean white sheet. <laughs> good food. This is the life. No more goddamn drinker for me. This is the life. But I found, I found, ladies and gentlemen, what many of us experienced those first year or two were in AA. Some of us experienced this feeling the first four or five years were in AA. I found when I was home for a month or so, I began to get irritable and nervous. I didn't know what the hell was wrong with me. I did not realize that this was the symptoms of this darn alcoholic disease again. I'd get home out of the subway and get home. And Rudy Valley was in great form those days on the radio. The kids would be doing their homework, and he'd be hauling his brains out, and I'd be walking around. And I'd go over to the kids, will you tell me how you're able to concentrate on this homework stuff and this guy hauling his brains out? And then the wife, 
Why don't you leave the kids alone, Jeff? And why the hell don't you shut up? <laughs> I know what I want. I could get a couple of drinks. I could study down. That's just two drinks. Study down, get over this damn nervousness. Ah, there was no way those days. With that in mind, I'd get out the house. The tavern was at the top of the street in Brooklyn. I'm not going to talk to nobody. I see these guys coming in the tavern every night from the subway there when I'm drinking. They come in there, they get their one or two drinks, and they go home, and that's it. That's the way I'm going to be. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. I'm not going to talk to nobody. When I had money, I always took a bottle of maker, a whiskey and a beer chaser. I'm going to have two out. And I'd get in there and I'd get the first one. And always they have the big mirrors at the back of the counters and those boot on taverns. Just looking at the mirror. And I'd take the second one. God damn it, I was getting better looking. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd walk out. I felt better. I cooled down. I'd apologize to the wife when I got home. Apologize to the kid. Now that's the way to drink. <laughs> Now, that night lying in bed, I think to myself, but tomorrow night, instead of coming home irritable, I'll make for the gin mill first. Hmm. <laughs> and get cooled down and come home nice. And I'd get in there right off the subway at 5 or 5.30. I have the first one. I'm only going to take two. And then order the second one. And then the sneaky look along the corner, and then the recognition of a neighbor or somebody. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Bob. What the hell his name was? You have a drink, Bob? Yeah, I'll have a drink. Give him a drink, eh? I'm still on my second one. So he gets his drink, and I'll finish mine. And I'm walk going to walk out. This happened so many times. And just I'm walking out, Bob, what his name is. Hey, Jeff, what the hell's the matter? Can't you have a drink with me? I had one with you. What are you rushing home for? When everyone was mean, if there's anything, it's Scotchman can't refuse it, something for nothing, God damn it. <laughs> and I'd get the other drink. Well, you know the story. The waking up in the morning, I'm in the doghouse. I'm sleeping alone. I still got my shoes on. Who the hell brought me home? What time is it? What time did I get home? God, I gotta have a drink. I'm dying. Jesus Christ, I gotta have a drink. What time is it? Are you open yet? No thought of the wife and the kids. The knowledge here it is all over again. All over the drinks. I've got to get straightened out. The rushing up to the having to get straightened out, the lemon sours and junk. Another day and another day, and then the old stuff again. Again the court, again the ordering out the house. Again the smoky. Again the picking up of the cops and slapping in hospital. And again, outside the hospital with the same question, why? Why am I again like this? I had no answer. No answer, ladies and gentlemen. And one morning on 3rd Avenue in Brooklyn, coming out of a flea bag. You know what a flea bag is, where there's a chicken wire. Oh, lousy, lousy, they are too. <laughs> I'm unshaved and filthy. I'd been on a terrific pier and I had no money. I'm coming out of this place. Wonder what the hell I'm going to do. I'm dying. I've been drinking. And I heard a voice say to me, Hello, Jeff. And looking up, I recognized a guy who worked in a different department when I worked. Gene. And he said to me, What are you doing with yourself, Jeff? I was unshaved. I was filthy. Right down and out. I said, I don't know, Gene, I'm sick. I was like this, I was all shaking. He says, come on, get in the car, I'll take you down the house with me. Oh, thank God, here's a man who knows he's going to give me a drink, God. Thank God. And anyway, if I don't get a drink, I'll touch him up for $2. He gives me in the car, he takes me down to his house, and his wife opened the door. And he said to her, I want you to meet Mr. Watson, my dear. And she put her hand out and she said, I'm awfully glad to know you, Mr. Watson. I hadn't been called Mr. Watson for quite a time and I didn't understand it then. But I understood it later that here was sympathetic understanding. 
And we got in the house and we sat down. And I'm waiting for Jean coming out with a bottle. <laughs> what the hell do you think Jean said to me? Jeff, would you like a bath? If there was anything I didn't want to see in shape or form was water, but asked me to sit in it. <laughs> and you know, when you're in the state of nose like that, you can't put your leg over the bloody bathtub on one leg, you'd break your neck. You're all nose. Anyway, that man, he got me in the bathtub. And he, uh, he bathed me, that guy. He took the, he, the socks were sticking to my feet. Then he had me sit on the side of the tub in the nude and try and shave me. And then he gave me one of his shirts. Poor Gene, God rest his soul. He was six foot one, and when he gave me a shirt, you think I had on a kimono, but Gene. <laughs> and he said, Jeff, I want you to get back in the car. I said, I don't want, I don't I'm going to get, I was sick when I went in, but I'm a hell of a lot sicker now after going through all this. I said, Gene, I can't go back in that car. I'm too sick. I'm too nervous. I had an over thing. He said, we're well, just going over the bridge in New York. It won't take long. He said, I want to take you to some place. Right again, you know, with the wife always bawling me out. If ever she saw me drinking, I figured, well, we want to drink outside. She's scared, I guess. <laughs> so I got back in the car. And as we're going over Brooklyn Bridge, he started talking about some little thing that had just started by the name of Alcoholics Anonymous. They had a disused mission over at 39th Street in New York, and that was where he was taking me. And he started trying to tell me that one time he, he was in a pretty bad state and he'd been thrown out the house. And I couldn't grasp what he was trying to get at. Uh, my head, I knew, uh, I knew if I didn't get a drink pretty soon, I'd go on a rack. Anyway, he got me over this little disused mission we're using, and he said there'd be a couple of guys there, and he'd have to get back to the office. He'd be back there at 5 o'clock that night to see me again. And sure enough, when we got up there, there were a couple of guys sitting around, and they started talking to me, and uh, they knew I was going to rest. I, I couldn't figure what the hell I was saying. I was answering at random, I guess. And they took me down to Bellevue. I was in there five or six weeks, during which time Gene visited me. While my head began to clear up, I began to grasp one or two of the things that Gene was trying to convey to me. And this time when I come out, I had a place to go to. A little disused mission on 39th Street, in New York. And I made for there. And that night, towards the end of 1938, I attended my first meeting. And after the meeting, one night, if you cover a cup of coffee with the rest of the boys, about 24 of us or so there. And Gene said, what do you think of the meeting? What do you think of the meeting, Jeff? I said, listen, Gene, does these guys all drink? And he says, every one of these guys can match any experience you've gone through, and some of them have gone through worse. Jeff? Well, I said, what the hell are they all so happy about? <laughs> You want me to be like these guys, Gene? You know I got no place to sleep tonight. Uh, I'd ask to go back to the wife of the family. I don't think I'll ever get back started with the company again. I owe money all over Brooklyn. I don't know which way to do or what to do. And you want me to be like these guys, Gene? Ah, Jeffy. Nice if you had five dollars in your pocket now, you'd go out and get drunk again, huh? Again, you want to hide yourself behind your wall of alcoholism, kill your own conscience, and let the rest of the world go by. Where's it ever got you, Jeff? Listen. Listen, Jeff. Come on along with us. Put your arm in ours, and we'll try and show you the new way of life we're beginning to find. Listen, you've only got one problem, Jeff. All these... Problems that you see ahead of you that you think are unsurmountable in time. In time, Jeff. They'll fade away. You've only got one problem. Keep off the first drink. One is one too many and twenty's not enough. God, down here was something I've been looking for for years. 
How many times had I taken one and twenty hadn't been enough? And me here with a living example sitting around me having coffee, proving it could be done, that this disease of alcoholism could be kept at bay by the power of the living example. Boy, I wasn't interested about how to stop drinking. Jesus, when you're in a psycho ward and you're tied up in a jacket there with bars on the window, you got to stop. I don't want to find out how the hell you stop, stop, stop drinking. But I wanted to find how the hell do you stop starting. And here was the answers coming right and left. And that night, Gene took me down to the Sally at 41st, at 41st, at 39th Street, it's 41st Street where the mission was. It took me down to the Sally at 39th Street, and I got in, he got in touch with the brigadier, and we got, got in the dormitory with a the man there that night, and the next one, the brigadier gave me a job in the kitchen. You know, the trucks going out, the derelicts coming in and whatnot. And again, I'm right back with the dishes. Two dollars a day. But every night, I made for AA. And it began to work. It began to work. I hung off that first ring. Ah, yeah. If there's anything I admire in Alcoholics Anonymous, when a man or a woman gets up and says, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic, I haven't lost my home. I haven't lost my job, but I'm an alcoholic. I admire those people. They're smart. They've had that King's County in a Bellevue in their own bedroom. And they've taken their own inventory, inventory, inventory. God damn, I gotta get educated again. <laughs> they've taken their own inventor. What is it, Don? <laughs> Inventory. Good. And haven't realized that this drinking, instead of them handling the drinking, the drinking's begin to handle them, and then life as a result is becoming a kind of unmanageable. It's interfering with the home life and the job. And realizing it's becoming a serious problem. And if by the grace of God they've been directed AA to AA, and then listening to the speakers, the realization of the progressiveness of this disease has brought to them a realization to do something about it now. Yeah, we have thousands of those kind of people in AA doing a wonderful job today carrying a message. I admire those people. And I also admire the people who come up on a platform and tell you, they did win a little time and then they had these so-called slips. But they come back. It takes guts to come back. And they commence to do a wonderful job in AA and they have a wonderful story to convey to us. Yes, I made calls in hospitals on people who have been in AA 10, 12, and even up to 15 years. And it always been the same answer to the question, why? They have found that maybe after a while, uh, they knew who was going to speak that night. They didn't go to a meeting. And then it began to get a habit with them to miss meetings. And then they got in with company somewhere where they didn't, nobody knew they belonged to AA probably, where cocktails were going. And they thought, well, what after what they know, they try it. They'd probably be able to beat it, but it never works that way. Because once you're an alcoholic, ladies and gentlemen, and this is actual statistics that these people can tell us, once they take that first one and get that, create that compulsion to carry on drinking, they can tear down in two or three days that which they may have built up in the last five, ten, or fifteen years. They revert right back to where they were before they came into AA. These people have a wonderful story, and I always like to be the first to shake their hand when they come back, because it is through these people that conveys to me the fact that by taking an active interest in the AA program, 
and the realization of the many blessings I've received since coming into this program. The ability to bring a little happiness and contentment to those whom are nearest and dearest to me. To bring a little peace of mind and contentment to myself. These are things that all the money in the world can't buy for us. But he gives it all free and only asks one thing in return. A little effort. A little effort. Keep off the first drink. And by attending these meetings and taking an active interest in the program, here we have the power of the living example. Yeah, those early years. I remember 1941, I think it was, Jack Alexander brought out a, an article on the Saturday Evening Post. It had quite an impact throughout the country. The Saturday Evening Post had quite a big circulation at that time. And he brought out an article on AA. And as a result of that, we were smothered with letters in New York and our group from all over the country. Some of these letters would break your heart asking for help. They were from villages, hamlets, ranches, towns, cities. To help them. We didn't have the literature, but we did try to the best of our ability to cover as many calls as we could around New York and Brooklyn and so on. We were very enthusiastic. We had a lot to learn in 12-step work. We'd go out individually. We had to learn through experience that it takes two to make a 12-step call. We have to learn it when a wife phones in and she says her husband's drinking to come along and save him. And you go there and he, you do, he doesn't know you're coming. You're in a hell of a mess. <laughs> we have to learn to get the man to phone, not us. I remember, I remember one call and there was all the years in Brooklyn, a call come in from 8060. I thought I'd go over and make a call. A full of ambition like we're all doing individually. This is where we had to learn to take two of us. And I got to this house, nice house, nice little home. I knocked at the door and the big guy in the red robe answered the door. He was on shaved and so on. And one look at him, I was, I knew he was on a terrific tear. And I said, how do you do? And he's about half shot. His wife wasn't in, and she had done the phoning. He didn't know I was coming. So I said, how do you do? I said, uh, I'm, uh, my name is Watson. I'm from an organization where I have here in New York, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I understand you're having a little trouble with your drinking, and I thought maybe I could come over and help you. This guy's about six foot with this long red robe on, you know. He says, what? And I repeated it again. Yeah. Come in. So I got inside and he got it. Two decent chairs and I said, oh man, I sat in one of the chairs. And he standing over me. He says, where do you see you from? I said, I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous, an organization. I said, there's a movement that we have here that's helping each other keep off drinking. Yeah. What's your identification? <laughs> I says, I have no identification. Where, where am I? Where am I? Says, where am I? Sit down, sit down. And he went through a door. And I heard him struggling. I don't know what the hell he was doing in the next room. But in about three minutes or four minutes, he come in. And when he come in, he had a priest badge on his big red robe. And then he had his belt and the gun hanging right in front of his petition. <laughs> down in between his legs. No, he says, you see who I am? We've had a lot of people getting raped around here, he says. you got no identification. Who the hell do I know who you are? <laughs> so I stood up as close as I could to him. I didn't want that hand to get down. Here was a guy half nut, and he had a gun. This is this way I had to learn to take two on these steps. And I stood as close as I could to him, and... So he couldn't get a hand down, and I started talking, and I really talked. And while I was talking to him, close, right up to him, I kind of swung him around a little bit, and I got my hand on that door that I came in. 
And when I got a hand on that handle out of that door like a shot out of hell. <laughs> you know, some of us feel that we're not made for 12-step work. <laughs> no, no, no. No, never get that in your head, ladies and gentlemen. You might know some people that seems to be bringing in, I think, what you call here in California, you call them pigeons. I don't know why, but never get discouraged on a 12-step call. We started one or two groups in New York, Flatbush, Bronx, one St. George, one Bay Ridge. About two years later, I was due to talk at this meeting at Bay Ridge. And then walked this guy. And I kind of recognized him. And I went up to him, I said, uh, how are you, do you remember me? No. I says, I see you're at the meeting tonight. Have you been here before? No. He says, I've never been at the meeting. He says, there's some, oh, you're the fellow that's come to my house. I says, you live on 860, don't you? He says, yeah. You're the guy that, that, that talked about uh, it's Alcoholics Anonymous? I says, yeah. Well, he says, you know, I'm in trouble with the department here just now. He says, I'm up for, in front of the commissioner, and he said, uh, I was still drinking. I don't know which way to turn. He says, I, I intend to cut it out, so I've come down here to learn something about AA. Well, I welcomed him and so on like that. And he sat through the meeting. He seemed to be very much impressed. We kind of followed him up on his trial, and he got through all right. We spoke to the commissioner there and so on. This man seemed to be sincere, and he carried on in AA. George turned out to be a very, very good man. He started that idea today throughout the, this, this country and other countries and these big syndicates, DuPont, and all these big auto manufacturing companies and so on. They've started their own group. There was one time they had no other alternative than to fire a good mechanic or a good man. If he was drinking or was, under the, was an alcoholic, they didn't know what the hell to do with them and they'd lose a good man. But George went over to the commissioner of New York after being in AA for a year or so and suggested to him that to try and form a group in the Metropolitan Police Department of New York City. And the commissioner was very much in favor of it. And they rented a room beside some patch there and they started a meeting on a Tuesday night just for the policemen. I had the pleasure throughout the years of talking to that group three or four or five times. The last time I had I think there's about 125 of them, membership on the Menard Palm Peace. All those boys have been in serious trouble, but they're now doing splendid work, and many of them advance themselves into higher positions. All through the seed of AA being set in this guy's brain at the time he ordered me out the house. So never get discouraged. If you leave a little seed of AA, you never know just when it's going to bloom forth and bring forth fruit. George has passed on now, God rest his soul. But they do have a memorial in their meeting room, the priest do, in memory of him, of the splendid work he'd done, and how many he helped in the Metropolitan Police Department. It's great the way they say he's worked. Ah, God, when you walk into a house, recalling one more incident, and you see a guy lying on the bed, he's out of this world. He, you can't talk to him. The, his bed is all upset. There's filth and dirt all over the floor. He's sick. He, he, he's out of this world. You can't talk to Tom. His little wife is in the kitchen. There's not a thing in the icebox. She's seven months pregnant. There's two kids. You don't know what to do. He get in touch with a little doctor in Bay Ridge who was very interested in AA, although he wasn't an alcoholic. He comes up and tells her he'll see her through a confinement, not to worry. He eventually gets Tom into the King's County. You visit him while he's in there. He's a riveter down to Bethlehem Steelworks on Third Avenue. When he comes out, he comes to a meeting or two. He begins to get a hold of the AA program. He gets back on his job, and he's bringing his money home every Friday night. This is the one that's brought into the world. He's got three kids now. And when Tom's been in about four or five months, 
he gets up to make his first talk in his own humble way to try and carry the message. And that night, his little wife comes down to hear Tom make his first talk. He's so proud. And you look at the peace of mind and contentment on that wife's face. And you see Tom up there in his own humble way trying to convey the message of AA. And realizing the predicament that Tom and that little woman was in only a few months ago. And as you sit at the back there and you think to yourself, maybe you had a little to do with bringing that happiness and contentment into that home. You get a feeling within you that all the liquor in the world couldn't give you. I think it was Sam Johnson that said, if you live right and do right, there's very little that'll go wrong. But if you live wrong and do wrong, there's very little that'll go right. But God, he, he's right. There's none of us will be perfect. I just got over 27 years in the but I'm not perfect by a long way. There's no differentiation between my problem and the problem of the newcomer in here tonight, maybe for his first time. I may have a little longer sobriety, but the problem is exactly the same. There's no seniority in AA. It was only four weeks ago that I addressed the young people's Hollywood group. They call themselves to meet on a Sunday morning about 11.30 on Wilshire Boulevard. I went down there to speak to them. There's about a hundred of them. I think the average age would be around about 22 to 23. There were some of them in there, 15 and 16, go-go girls, and I don't know what. And what they could tell you, boy, would knock you for a go. But here they were trying to get AA. And as I said to them, I said, it makes me proud. AA will be here, I think, as long as the United States is here. You young people are left to carry the message. We may be what we phrase as old-timers, but many of us are passing along. You people will carry the message. You've got something in life to look forward to, a life of good. As I say, we'll never be perfect. I still like to go to the race track. God darn, I like to see Hollywood and the waterfalls and Santa Anita with its palm trees and those lousy horses. <laughs> Oh, I'll let you do some 12-step work amongst them suckers. <laughs> and so we go along. Yeah, I got seven grandchildren now. Two girls are married very well. One of them is in Holland at present with her husband. He's a Big shot of some of this corny company handling the bee. He's an architectural engineer or something that sets up these refineries or something. He's over there now for three or four years handling about four or five hundred men, I understand. The other girl is married to one of the leading education men you have here in California. He's done awfully well. Last year, the wife and I made a trip to Scotland. First time in 40 years. I had a sister over there. She's 84, the last of the family. She's the eldest. And don't think I'm 83. Or something like that, none of you go go girls. I'm not 83 yet. <laughs> and we visited the people in Scotland. I spoke in Edinburgh, and Glasgow, London. God darn, and they're wonderful. No matter, it seems to me, no matter what country you go to, Australia, any place at all, you'll find the groups. And no matter how strange you are in a strange city, you just go to a meeting and you've got friends. Let me stop talking for about 10 or 15 seconds while you and I ask ourselves a question tonight. Here we are, sitting together on a Saturday night. We're contented, we're with good people, people that speak our language and know what problem we have, and by knowing we are assisting each other by the fact of being here, shown that we can live this way of life and enjoy it. But let us ask ourselves one question. Where would you and I be tonight 
What would our life be like tonight if by the grace we had grace of God we hadn't found AA? Yeah. Surely the answer to that must fill our hearts with appreciation of this great program. I know it's two men, Bill and old Doc. Bill and Brooke in New York, they get a kind of what he call a spiritual experience. He's able to lay off his stuff five or six weeks. And the old Doc up in Akron got wise to it. They were great friends. And he, Doc's wife wrote to Bill and asked him and his wife to come up and visit him. They wanted to know how he stopped drinking because the Doc was on a terrific drunk. And Bill went up to Akron. And the Doc wanted to know how he stopped drinking. And Bill said, you know, if you stop drinking, Doc, it'll help me a lot. And the Doc said, well, if you can do it, maybe, Bill, maybe I can do it. Here was one of the foundation stones of the Alcoholic Synonymous program being laid, the power of the living example. And it began to work. And along came the second God-given inspiration of these two men, carry the message. And him and his sister, the two of them and his sister Ignatius went down to the hospitals of Akron, picking up the derelicts and the first group of Alcoholics Anonymous was started in Akron. And Bill came down to the book and was thrown out of a room and out there through the derelicts. He was driving in there. And then they opened up our place up at 39th, 41st Street, New York. Doors extended. Yeah, we have a lot to be thankful for as we sit here tonight. I think one of the greatest things that I appreciate so much in AA, I'm now kind of semi-retired. I'm out here kind of in that advisory capacity for the company. We bought a little home in Pasadena. We have our own home. We're going over to visit the daughter this coming summer. There's been great happiness in my home. I'm very proud of grandchildren. Uh, I think they like the grandpa. I want to take you back to that gutter. Sitting there, a lonely, unhappy, lost soul, held in contempt by his fellow men. If everybody had said, you see that nut sitting there talking to himself, someday he'd be a respected citizen. Someday he may have the respect of his fellow man. Someday he may have his own home, his own car, and the respect of his family. God, yeah. Yeah, he works. You bet it does. If you want it, it'll work. It'll work. And this is a serious disease. Don't kid yourself. If you have any doubts, my friend, you, you get into New York City, get into Chicago, L.A., or Frisco, or any of these big cities. I know from personal experiences in New York City, at Bellevue there, the barge pulls up every Tuesday morning. At 10.30, every Tuesday morning it pulls up. And they take anywhere from 25 to 30 boxes out of the ice house. People picked up in that big city. They don't know where they come from. They don't know who they are. Yeah, I lived with those. I lived with those kind of people at one time. In some God-given way, they know they're on their last, last drive or something. And at one time in their life, I presume they were respected and loved by someone in their younger days. And rather than let them know how they died and remove every piece of identification... From them, and when they're picked up, nobody knows who they are, where they come from. And I put on that barge every Tuesday morning and taken up the island and put in the pauper's grave. I don't care much money I have. Once you've lost control of drinking, and you persist and carry on drinking, if you have plenty of money, you'll finish in a nut house. Nut house. And if you have no money, you'll finish as many of us did down the gutter. It has been a pleasure being here tonight. 
Going about time, eh? It's been a pleasure, Don. It's been a pleasure seeing you and uh, Betty here on our feet again. I had the pleasure of addressing, I think, your second meeting, uh, this fellowship meeting that Don, Don invited me up from Los Angeles. It was raining that night. Now, God damn it, it's raining again tonight. <laughs> It was nice of our little girl Louise to ask us up, to ask me up here, and it was very, very nice of Marty to meet me and take me down to that Walter who only runs that restaurant. Got a free dinner there. <laughs> Boy, that was worth a trip alone. <laughs> and I can't figure how a guy with five bars in his place is able to keep sober. You got to hand it to him. I was saying to Marty, there, God's sake. Our trouble was trying to get the money to get more drink. Can you imagine, Marty, if we had five bars, we'd have been dead years ago. <laughs> He's got to be handed a lot of credit. And in closing, ladies and gentlemen, I'm catching the plane back in the morning. I'm staying at the center if any of you girls want to know where I'm living. <laughs> the wife's not with me tonight. She was with me last time. We have about four people visiting us just now, and she's busy with them. That's why I got to get away back in the early in the morning. I wish she had been here tonight, because a couple of years after here, I got back home, as, as you realize. And she's done a tremendous amount of fine A work. She started up the Allen Island groups in New York. She's been a great worker, and it's been a, I've been very proud of she's been able to make it here tonight. We're getting along fine. God, when I think of getting over those drunks, I used to lie in bed there, swear that Jesus was going to die. I'd be in the doghouse, of course. Nobody in the house would be torn to me. And I'd hear her in the kitchen, you know, doing the dishes. And I'd swear I'm going to die. B, B. <laughs> Will you squeeze me an orange? And then that beautiful romantic voice coming back of a coming there, squeeze your goddamn neck. <laughs> Jesus. It's all changed. And talking about our fine minister over here that spoke so wonderfully well to Matt, I thought he had a wonderful message for us. You know, I never went to church for many years, previous to AA. The wife would take the kids to Sunday school, of course. She's a good Presbyterian. But I never bought a church some other. I didn't disbelieve that there must be some body in supreme command, uh, the stars, the sun, the flowers, the thousand and another one, things a man will never be able to understand, but I feel that God does, I guess, but I never attended church or anything, but at the end of these drunks, I was continuously alibying to the wife, as you've heard me, about I'd never drink again, God, give me another chance, I'll never drink again, and uh, it had never worked that way. And uh, I was reaching the stage now where she was going to take me to court several times. You know, I was beginning to get to that stage. And uh, this morning I, I woke up in hell. I was in the doghouse. I didn't know which way to turn or do. And I walked out of the house. I was in the... Uh, how can I get back in the good books of the wife, you know, and the kids? I want, to, want somebody to talk to. Hell, nobody talking to me in the house. <laughs> and I'm walking up there and I come to 56th Street and there's a little church there. A little uh, home next door where the minister lived. And a new idea struck me. I thought, I never tried this on her before. Maybe she'll go for this. Because I knew she went to church with the kids. And I knocked at this door of this little parsonage. And a young fella come to the door about 30 or 35. And I, and I was shaking and sick. I wanted sympathy. And I didn't know where the hell to get it. And I said to him, I said, uh, I'm having a lot of trouble down my house. I said, I've been drinking pretty heavy. And I said, I'd like you to come down to my house with me. Maybe we can pray. This is a new angle, see? <laughs> and he listened to me, and he, he said, yeah, all right, we'll go down. So I take him down the house, and anything I dragged in, of course, she ignored. But the the man opened his mind, I, I tell B, this is a man from the church. He says, you know I haven't gone to church for years. Maybe this is the cause of me drinking. This is a new stunt. I was trying to get in a good book. But really, he started talking. She realized he was a man of the church. 
And then he suggested after a little talking that we go in the kitchen and we kneel at the kitchen table and pray for God's help. So the three of us went in the kitchen, the three of us kneeled down at the table, and the two of them were praying like hell there. <laughs> and, and then when we get up, she said to the pastor, she said, would you like a cup of coffee? And then she looked at me and she said, would you like a cup too? <laughs> it's the first time she spoke to me for about four weeks. And I was in. <laughs> Jesus, nine weeks later, I'm in the same predicament. And like all crazy alcoholics, if it worked before, it'll work again. So up I go to the town pastor's house again. And I knock at the door. And sure enough, this by about 10 o'clock in the morning, came to the door, the same guy. And I'm out. I said, do you remember me? He says, yes. Well, I want you to come down and pray. And as true as my name is Jeff Watson, I don't know to this night, ladies and gentlemen, whether he said I was on the road to hell or to go to hell, but he didn't come down the... <laughs> He didn't come down to pray. Yeah. So this is the kind of life, what a life, what a life, what a life. And after a couple of years in AA, in realization of the many blessings that seem to be coming my way. Although I may have deserted God, I began to feel that he had never deserted me. And I, in my own solitude one night, got on my knees and started thanking him for having guided me to AA and to try and help and guide me to keep with it. That he has done. As our minister said tonight, we just ask, Ask for guidance, and if we have faith, we will receive it. And I have found with a sincere faith in God and the belief in this program that life has become too precious now to me. I have too much at stake to ever again take the chance of taking that first drink. And the only way I can keep away from that first drink and continue on the life that I've been leading these last few years is to associate and take an active interest in the program and in my own humble way try and carry the message because we we're getting kind of old now not many young people in this room tonight fine people you'll carry it on I know and I only hope, ladies and gentlemen, that when my days are over, and if I'm fortunate enough to come to St. Peter at the Golden Gate, I only hope I'll hear him shout at the top of his voice, open up those Golden Gates. Here comes a good member of AA. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.